Someone sent me a video where Sabor Ahmed argues that eternal hell is logical because a crime against an infinite and supreme being requires an infinite punishment. He adds that objections to eternal hell are just emotional. Here's a short clip, but the full video is linked below. If a finite being, it does a crime against an infinite being, against a being that in terms of magnitude is incomparable, then the punishment is just as severe. So following on from the first point and the second point, hell is not a logical problem, it's an emotional problem. And I've dealt with this many times, so has Mansur, so has Hashim. Oftentimes, when we break it down logically, if God is all-powerful and all-knowing and God is supreme, and the greatness of God and the glory of God is exactly what the theists say it is, then a microsecond of disbelief in God could result in an infinite time in hellfire. However, this is a non sequitur. There is no reason why God's infinite nature should require infinite punishment. It is simply an assertion that doesn't follow logically from its premise. This is an argument that has been around for a long time and was popularized by Christian apologists such as Thomas Aquinas, who said, The magnitude of the punishment matches the magnitude of the sin. Now a sin that is against God is infinite. The higher the person against whom it is committed, the graver the sin. It is more criminal to strike a head of state than a private citizen. And God is of infinite greatness. Therefore, an infinite punishment is deserved for a sin committed against him. It's a catchy argument, but when one looks beyond its pleasing symmetry, there is no logical connection between God's infinite nature and how he might choose to punish sinners. It's true that human society contains examples where a person's status influences the level of punishment, but that doesn't mean it's always right or logical. For example, many ancient societies punished crimes against slaves less severely than crimes against free men. But does that mean it is right? However, even if one were to accept that since God is of infinite high status and majesty, sin against him is of infinite seriousness, it still doesn't follow that it must be punished eternally. God is not confined or restricted in any way. Whether a crime against him is of infinite seriousness or not, doesn't tie his hands nor determine how he must punish it. More crucially, God's infinite nature and majesty is only one factor. There is, of course, the nature of the perpetrator and the crime itself to be considered when determining the seriousness of the crime. Unlike a God of infinite nature and majesty, humans are finite, limited and fallible creatures. Even the most stubborn disbeliever's culpability is limited by his very nature. As for the crime itself, one must consider the harm it causes to the victim, which in the case of God is of course none. God is not harmed nor diminished in any way by disbelief. One might argue that the crime of disbelief causes harm to other humans, but then we are no longer talking about a crime against an infinite God, but instead against finite humans. There is also another problem which concerns religious claims and whether they have been left open to reasonable doubt. As I have said in previous videos, if one is going to punish disbelief so severely, then the first and most essential precondition before the test of this life can even proceed is that every single human being must know beyond any shred of doubt that Islam is the one and only true religion. It should not be a question one needs to ask. It cannot be open to debate, contention, interpretation or dispute. It should not need preachers standing on soapboxes in Speaker's Corner, bookstalls on the high street or long-winded apologetics about why human evolution is wrong. It should be clear and obvious to every single human being instantly and perfectly which of course God could easily do, simply by saying be and it is. And no, it would not spoil the test. Because the test isn't about whether we are able to navigate through a maze of competing and inconclusive claims. The test is whether we knowingly reject Islam or not. And we can't knowingly reject Islam or not unless we first know for certain that Islam is the truth. 
As for the claim that the objection to hell is purely emotional and not logical, I must respectfully disagree. The contradiction between an all-merciful God and eternal torture is a perfectly logical and reasonable contention, and one that is shared by many great scholars throughout the centuries who have argued against it on the basis of logic and reason. Even many Muslims and Christians argue against eternal hell. For example, the Muslim scholar Ibn Taymiyyah, in his book, Arrad ala man qala bi fana al jannah wa nar, argued that God does everything according to a wise purpose, and since eternal hell serves no purpose, it therefore contradicts his divine wisdom. He goes on to say that God's mercy encompasses all things, and it prevails over his anger, while torture is not one of God's intrinsic attributes, and therefore will cease. He says at one point, As for God creating souls who commit evil in this world, while in the hereafter they will only exist in torment, this is a contradiction which contradicts wisdom and mercy like nothing else. Marilyn McCord Adams, an Anglican priest and philosopher, put the logical objection to an eternal hell succinctly when she said, If God exists and is omnipotent, he would be able to avoid sending anyone to eternal hell. If God exists and is omniscient, he would know how to avoid sending anyone to eternal hell. If God exists and is good, he would want to avoid sending anyone to eternal hell. Therefore, if an omnipotent, omniscient, good God exists, eternal hell cannot. On a final note regarding Sabora's claim that the objection to hell is driven by emotions, the truth is that we are all driven by emotions, as well as logic and reason. The best we can strive to do is to apply reason and logic as diligently as we can, while recognising our biases and emotional attachments. Is it really logic alone that motivates Sabor to defend eternal hell? If the Qur'an had said hell was finite, would he then declare the Qur'an to be illogical because it lacks the compellingly rational doctrine of burning people alive for all eternity?